Have you ever wondered what it's like to invite Christ into your heart? That's what we'll talk about today. God sees hearts as we see faces. George Herbert. Today we're going to talk about the book, My Heart, Christ's Home by Robert Boyd Munger. This was a book that, after I got over the initial panic of me becoming a Christian, was about the first Christian living book that I read. As a brand new convert to Christianity, the words have stuck with me all these years. I mean, now it's been decades, and I still think about this book. Is it never even crossed my mind that you could invite Christ into your heart? To me, faith is a brain thing. It's not a heart thing. But after reading this book, I realized it's much more than a brain thing. He talks about Ephesians 3.16. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Wow, in your heart. And not only that, but this was a prayer that was given up for an entire community from Paul. And he said another way that you could translate is that Christ may settle down and be at home in your hearts by faith. So the question is, is do we invite Christ into our hearts? And if we do, is it just as a guest? Hey, come on over, see what you see. Or is it someone that we've asked to move in and live in our hearts, settle down in our hearts? That means that someone's going to kick off their shoes and stay there forever. So then, if we want God to come into our hearts, the real question is, how much of our hearts do we actually have to show him in order for him to be at home in our heart? And the whole analogy of this book is that we invite God in. And he's walking around our house asking about all the different rooms we have. Would we feel comfortable? I know I don't like having guests into my house normally. Now I'm going to invite Jesus into my house and my heart and have him stay there. Whoo-wee. That is a big, bold change that would come to any person's life. And we know that eventually God is going to prepare a place for us in his home. So it's a reciprocal request. He stays in our home and eventually we go home to be with him. And you can imagine, according to the book, what a difficult, weird time it was when we had Pentecost. Jesus comes down from the mountain, and they expected him to stay, to finish the mission on earth, to be with them, help them, and encourage them on this very, very tough journey. But instead, what he did is he sent the Holy Spirit to us who would dwell in our hearts and connect us to Jesus all the time. It was a weird concept, I'm sure, for Jewish people at the point Because God lived in temples. God lived in the temple in Jerusalem. We built tabernacles for God to dwell. This idea that God can dwell with us all the time was new and shocking. I'm sure they weren't prepared for what that meant. Jesus said it. The Holy Spirit was coming. They experienced the Holy Spirit coming onto them. But I don't know if anyone really understood what that meant. In the book, it says, quote, he came into the darkness of my heart and turned on the light. He built a fire in the cold hearth and he banished the chill. There are so many places in the Bible where God is discussed as a light into darkness. And this analogy then into the home of the cold hearth and then put a warm fire there means something to me. I love campfires. I love fireplaces. And so if Jesus is building a warmth center inside of us, it matters. Also talks about how in Revelations 3.20, that God was knocking at the door and hoping someone opens it for him. So the first room we come into is the study, which would be the library, the office, the place that we work, or we do some research People used to have, I think, studies a little bit more in the past. But then we invite him in, and he sees a lot of the books that we have around us. Most of them aren't bad books, magazines. Some of them reflect interests that we used to have that we no longer have. 
And it's not that, again, the books were bad or they were that embarrassing. They also weren't about Jesus. They weren't about the things that were going to fill us up with the Spirit of God. So Jesus offers to let me help clean that up for you. And they take out all the material that's either not good, not true, not something that's going to help us in our walk and life, and takes them out. Then, with all the empty bookshelves that are there, puts the Bible there. Things that will help us learn about the Bible and pictures on the wall that will help us have images for God. And right in the middle of the room, Jesus hangs a very large painting of himself because he wants us to consider him centrally all the time. And so with his presence in our lives and the scriptures there in our lives, then we're able to focus on the things that's going to help us, make us stronger instead of bringing us down. You know, I read a lot of books and I don't think this book is calling for us to throw out our books. Remember, this is the home inside our heart. But there are books that go any way from having nothing to do with God to some that go directly against God. And the question is, is that bringing you up or is it bringing you down? There's this old analogy of the two wolves, right? There's one wolf that is helping you become better and the other wolf that is tearing you down. And whichever wolf you feed, that's the wolf that's going to get better and win. And that's what made me think about in this analogy. Are we bringing things into our soul through reading that are encouraging us, making us stronger and making us better? It's so easy to think about all the different messages we get and whether or not they bring us closer to God. The next is the dining room. And the dining room is where he says that all the appetites are satisfied. But he also means desires too. It's where we have the good meal. It's also where we think about the stocks and the news and the financial situations that we have. It's what we're feeding our souls with. And the question is, when we eat food, that's bad for us. Maybe it's poison. Maybe it's spoiled. Maybe it's just not very good for us. We go through any type of stage where we're either throwing it up, feeling terrible afterwards, or feeling sick afterwards. But what about all those things that we bring into our soul? What about all those other things that we're taking in that can't make us sick? Because when we poison our soul, we don't throw up. We don't get sick in the same way. But maybe we get sick in other ways, either through worry or being disturbed. I forgot what it was last night even. Something came on about the financial situation and, you know, this was going to happen and that was going to happen. And then I found myself being very disturbed by it all. And it's not like anything changed. It's not like there's anything I can do about it. And yet my whole demeanor changed just because I heard this one piece of news. What are we eating that is causing us woe? And what are we eating that's not bringing us closer to God, closer to heaven, and actually seeking the real things, the real food that will not only satisfy us, but be everlasting? Good uh, food for thought there. The next comes in is the living room. This is the comfy room with the big sofa and the fireplace and nice comfy chairs and blankets. And after he's sitting there for a while, he realizes He's been ignoring Jesus this whole time. He's just been relaxing and resting and taking a nap. And he thought, I invited Jesus into my heart to come live here as my friend and savior. And now I'm ignoring him. And Jesus says, quote, in this book, whether or not you want to be with me, remember, I want to be with you. I really love you. And that's the truth of it. God does love us and does want to be with us in times of stress times where we're eating the wrong thing, or in times of comfort and napping. And that we should always remember that we can put God back in the focus of every room in our house. And that, I think, is the part that gets to me. You know, I work pretty hard, and I'm very dedicated to my job. And then when I'm tired, I go down to my living room, put in the recliner chair, 
watch some TV and I'm relaxing. And I don't often think about God because I'm doing something else because I'm trying to rest. But is there any better rest that we can get in our hearts than having the rest that God gives us? And if we can learn how to rest with God, it'll make us a lot more calm and peaceful than if we rest with the other things in the world. At this point, God asks if he could be brought into the workroom. You know, this would be like the shop where this guy apparently tried to build some toys, wasn't very good at it. Kind of wished that he was good at, you know, building things. And Jesus asked him in the book, would you like to do better? And that's where he brings up John 15, 5. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So Jesus says, I will help you. And that the Holy Spirit is the master worker. And between the two of them, they will help us make amazing things, that they will guide our work. And if we realize that the work is theirs, there's nothing that we have to worry about. That There's nothing we have to be down about, discouraged about, because it's God's work through us. We just have to make ourselves available to it. And that's the part where this podcast became important to me, because a lot of times when the church asks you to do something, and it's terrible for me to say this, but they want me to cook and they want me to bring baked goods or they want me to do something like that. That is not where my talents and skills are. Or if we have an evangelism day, it's always, here's 20 pamphlets, walk around the neighborhood and hand these out. I used to know someone who was great at that, and I am not great at that. So I wondered, is there any way that I can make myself available to God apart from doing things that I'm not particularly good at? Is there something that I can take my gifts and talents and use them for the purpose of the kingdom? Having already had a podcast that's doing well, learning all the skills that it took, it became apparent to me that this is where I could take that marriage of the things I'm interested in, the places where I feel like I've been given talents and gifts from God, and then making myself available to the gospel so that I can share it with other people. This was really that intersection. And so I hope, like this author hopes, that when he goes into the workroom, which is for me my podcasting room, I'm doing the work of God. I hope that happens. <laughs> we'll see. And I'm thankful for all the things that God has given me in this opportunity. The next room is the rec room. That's where we play. You know, back in the day, we'd probably have a pool table, some other fun things. Then the fellow in this story says he wants to go out and hang out with his friends. And he goes, well, I don't think you really enjoy hanging out with me and my friends. And so Jesus in the story questions, maybe we could go to a Bible study, attend a social at church. So we can encourage one another and be with one another. I think in there, too, are there places where you can explain how important the message of Jesus is to other people? When I was at the presentation I was doing a few weeks ago, people asked me, well, how is it that you can talk about God in this world? And what's interesting to me is that if we see a really good movie, if we eat a really great meal, it is easy for us to talk with our friends about, oh, I ate this great food. The restaurant was fantastic. The service was fantastic. The desserts were amazing. It's so easy for us to talk about. But then when we get to the part we're talking about Jesus or we're talking about any type of religious experience, it's very hard for us. And I think that that problem is twofold. First of all, we don't have any religious experiences, so we don't know what to talk about. God is completely amiss in our lives. And so when we get together with friends and we think about the things I could tell my friends, about God, he's not there because he's not there in my heart. He's not a part of my activities, so I have nothing really to talk about. So that's where we have to work at bringing God into our lives. So when we say, hey, Jill, what'd you do last weekend? Oh, I went to this amazing seminar at my church. They were talking about this idea I'd never heard about before. Or I was reading this book where it talked about inviting God into your heart. And you know what? I never considered it. Now you have something that you can talk about, and it makes it easier <laughs> to talk about something when you have something. But then the other part of it is, is do we appreciate it the same way we appreciate a great meal, a fantastic movie, 
And if we're not having that experience, it's for us to work on so that we get to the place where we're excited to talk about God in our lives, not just trying to make something up, think of something. So I realize that when I am not talking about God to other people, a lot of times it has to do with me and what my thoughts are about God in my life. And then he brings up John 15, 11, Remember, I have come that joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. We are supposed to be joyful about God. And if that's true, we will have fun being in this presence and we'll be excited to tell other people about it too. So the next two rooms, one is the bedroom and the other is the family room, where the author of the book wonders if he's strong enough to keep his family together, to be loving to his wife, and to do all the things that he needs to do to have a fantastic family. And in each case, God says, let me help you with this. God cares about the family, and he cares about the people in the family, and he wants to help you be a part of that family and be a positive force inside of your family. And if you feel like you're struggling, if you feel that you're not strong enough, that's when God can really help you. A friend of mine told me once that, She married her husband because he loved God more than anyone. Because she knew, she said, that if he just loved her, that comes and goes. And he could fall into temptation. He could get tired of her. But if he loves God more than anyone, that is the thing that makes their relationship work and cements them together as a marriage because that's what's the most important part. That always struck me. And I always hoped in my own life that I would find someone who loved God in that way. The next part was the kitchen. And this is where they've enjoyed all the meals. And that's where Christ remembers that it's the bread of life that will give us nourishment forever. And that's where we have to think about what we're actually taking into our bodies. The last part, and this is the one that stood out to me in remembering the book, was the very last room, which was the hall closet. He said that this is a room that is overstuffed, that it actually kind of smelled, and it was behind a lock and key. And Jesus wanted to see what was in there. And he's like, no, Jesus, you don't want to see what's in this closet. It's really about old stuff. It's about things that don't matter anymore. I really don't want to show you what's in here. He said that in there were things from an old life, not wicked, but they weren't good either. And so this is where it was a mess. It was smelly. It was too much, he said. He didn't want to open this up for Jesus. And Jesus said to him that if you think I'm going to stay in this house with this smelly room in here and not help you to clean it out, you think you're wrong. And that's where he finally relented gave Jesus the key and asked if he could clean the closet because he doesn't have the strength to do it. And as Jesus walked through this history of things that were in there, he said that, quote, no matter what sin or what pain there may be in my past, Jesus is ready to forgive, to heal, and to make whole. And so all this time in this pretty nice house, he's been hiding the secret of the closet and all the junk, the smelly garbage that's in there. And at the end of the book, he realized that he had been treating God like a guest. Instead of just saying, make yourself at home, walk around, do whatever you like. He was giving God this concierge tour of his own house, showing him the rooms that he was interested in, Jesus helping him, maybe like the workroom, but not helping him with the areas he found embarrassing. And it made me think a little bit about the other houses that we've seen in the Bible, where we had a dinner at Mark's house, where we saw Mary and Martha and their priorities. And you know what? Jesus wasn't just the God of preaching to a large group of people, but he was the God of coming into your home and seeing what rooms, seeing what activities you do inside your own house. So this book is a second edition of the book. It was, at the time I read it, a pamphlet. And then the author was given a chance to add some additional rooms to this book. 
And it made me think even a little bit, too, about me adding more rooms to the house, too. What about a game room? What kind of games are we playing? Do we think Jesus would like to play the games we play? Or would he like us to do different things? Have different experiences than maybe those games? Or even our garage where we love our car and we take special care of our car. Well, maybe the rest of our house falls apart. The analogy of the house is amazing. It could go on quite a bit. So my challenge to you is think about your house. If you were excited to show God a room in your house, what room would that be and why? And if your heart was a house, what room would you be most excited to show God? And then think about what room would you be least excited to show God? Certainly, I think for me, it was the living room, the cozy, comfy place that I'd crawl up in the blanket and nap. I burned so much time in that room and rarely consider God. So that was my big challenge. Think about your own and think about what that means about where you can invite Jesus into the home of your heart. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening. Please remember that you can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. And you can tell me how I can pray for you. You can tell me if there's topics that you're interested in hearing. I'd love to hear what you think. Please remember that this is a brand new podcast and I'm trying to grow the audience. So share this with someone else you think might like the podcast. And remember that you can invite God into your heart and show them all the rooms by taking small steps.